Next, we're going to have Dr. Garza come up. Dr. Garza is one of our members of the Colorectal Surgery Institute. She's going to come up and, and kind of fight for the team and talk about the colorectal's view, colorectal surgeon's view of uh, rect rectal seal. Sorry, let me figure out the stuff. Good morning. Okay, so today I'm going to talk primarily about rectoceles since in the colorectal world that's what we um, deal with uh, mostly. So pelvic floor disorders um, are pr pretty much poorly studied and um, the prevalence of disease has been um, really a mystery up until about 2008 and that's because before that time there were only some limited regional studies that really looked at how many women are affected with pelvic floor disorders. And there was a regional study that was done in the United States which showed that a, probably about 10% of women have surgery for urinary incontinence, pelvic floor prolapse, or both during their lifetime. And 30% of those have uh, two or more surgical procedures. Um, but because the prevalence of the disease was largely unknown, the, amount, the burden that we have, um, the national burden was, was unknown as well. So a national population-based survey was done um, by the um, Institutes of Health, and they found that 23.7% of women had symptoms of at least one pelvic floor um, disorder. 15% experienced urinary incontinence, 9% of women exp um, experienced fecal incontinence, and 2.9% actually experienced symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse. And what they found in the study is that the prevalence actually increases with age. So while you're young, your incidence of having pelvic floor disorders is about 9.7%, but as you get o older, um, up into the 80 years of age, you're looking at almost half of the patients will have some type of pelvic floor disorders. Looking at patients' BMI, um, overweight women are more likely to report at least one pelvic floor disorder. Parity, like Dr. Valdez was talking about, is that the more women, that you, the more babies that you have, the more chance you are of having a pelvic floor disorder. So it's estimated that by the year 2030 that be, a fifth of the women will be over 65, and so as the population becomes older, then the, nation, the um, national burden related to pelvic floor disorders will actually be quite significant. So we talked a lot about the anatomy, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but what essentially it is is a weakness in the rectovaginal septum. So this is a normal rectovaginal septum, and here there's a weakness, so the rectum bulges into the vagina. And so the patients will actually develop an outpouching of the rectum into the vagina when they're trying to evacuate. So this is a, um, a, a, this is a diagram of the, uh, the attachments to the vagina. So there's usually three levels of attachments of the vagina. Uh, one level which is um, attached um, by these uteral sacral ligaments and that's really um, anchored in place by the cervix. Your second level is the, um, the main portion of the vagina which has lateral attachments and then you have the most inferior attachments with this, which is the perineal body. Looking at it um, from a different angle, um, the vagina is primarily attached at the cervix and at the perineal body, and these are where you have your most common um, sites of injury or tears to the rectal vaginal septum, which lead to a rectocele. <coughs> so like we've talked about a number of times is the symptoms of, of a rectocele, it's sometimes very clear some, and a lot of times very unclear. So the patients will complain about having problems evacuating, they'll feel bulge or pressure in their um, perineal area. Uh, one of the classic descriptions of a rectocele is the patient says they can't evacuate, but, in order to, but they are able to by placing a finger into the vagina and straightening out the rectal wall, and then they're able to use the, um, the bathroom um, effectively. Um, after chronic rectocele um, can cause widening of the levator hiatus, increases the vaginal caliber, and then eventually lead to sexual dysfunctions. Uh, so the risk factors for a rectocele is, um, usually, number one is the process of childbirth. There's indirect causes, which is related to the chronic straining, um, and that's causing compression of the uh, pudendal nerve which um, can indirectly cause, um, cause a problem. 
And the more direct causes are abnormal descent and instrumental deliveries, as Dr. Valls has talked about. Other conditions that lead to in, um, higher incidence of rectocele is anything that increases your intradominal pressure. So patients with COPD that are coughing a lot, that are overweight, or that are chronically constipated tend to have an increased <coughs> risk. Other non-preventable causes are collagen disorders, aging, and postmenopausal status, as Dr. Valdez talked about. So there aren't a lot of studies that we can do to really evaluate a rectocele other than a physical exam and, what, um, and a, what's called a defecography. It's an exam where um, it's not the funnest thing to do, but they're <laughs> going to, they put like a paste contrast into the rectum, you sit on a commode that's connected to an x-ray, and they actually shoot a bunch of x-rays um, looking at the patient defecating. So, <laughs> it's hard sell for the patients, but actually the patients that are really symptomatic, they show up for these tests. I actually tell them exactly what they're going to have done, so there's no surprises when they get there. So uh, what we look, when we looked at the defecography, for us as colorectal surgeons, because a lot of times the symptoms are so vague, and just because you have a rectocele doesn't mean we have to fix it. So we're trying to pick out the patients that would benefit most from a repair. And those patients we think that benefit the most repair are those that have contrast retained in the rectocele. So what happens is the patient defecates, the contrast, the, well, the contrast goes up from the bottom, the patient defecates, the contrast, you can see the bulge, and then once the, everything's completely evacuated, there's still contrast that's left in this rectocele. So those patients, we tend to recommend surgery if they are truly having symptoms. Uh, one thing that we do uh, measure to kind of get an idea of the size of the rectocele, but just because it's a big rectocele doesn't mean it needs to be fixed. If it's smaller rectoceles can be equally as, as um, clinically symptomatic. Uh, we uh, look at the anterior anorectal axis and then measure that distance to the um, end of the rectocele and that gives you the size, but it doesn't really make that much of a uh, difference. So when you look at the preoperative evaluation, um, gynecologists don't tend to use this study. It's estimated about 6% of them order the study. We as colorectal surgeons tend to use it more. And I think that has to do with a lot of the philosophy of why colorectal surgeons repair rectocele versus a gynecologist. And, but it's really unclear whether this study actually helps um, delineate which patients are gonna do better. So from a colorectal surgeon's perspective, uh, most gynecologists consider repairs necessary during routine pelvic reconstructive surgery and then it's really no risk. So it's, if they're there, it's, they fix it. Um, we tend to get um, patients that are a little bit more unclear of whether this is related to their symptoms, maybe their rectocele is a little bigger, or it's an isolated rectocele. The gynecologists tend to deal with the cystoceles and all the other things that go along with the rectocele. We tend to deal with it when it's just an isolated rectocele. We as colorectal surgeons are more interested in function, um, so when we do the surgery, our goals are a little bit, a little bit different. Now, um, the, like I said, we both gynecologists and colorectal surgeons, they both believe that the presence of the rectocele does not necessarily mean you need surgery. There's a lot of women walking around with rectoceles and we don't even talk to them about surgery. It's the ones that really come to your attention that are constantly, constantly complaining of these vague symptoms. Um, so the first thing we do is we try to uh, manage the patient medically with a high fiber diet and um, non-alcoholic high fluid intake. So indications for surgery um, in the literature, pretty much ob obstructive defecation symptoms, uh, pelvic pressure, um, heaviness, and large vaginal hiatus. Like I said, the presence of rectocele is not an indication for surgery, and some symptoms just aren't improved even though we do the rectocele. So there are patients that we say, you know, we do this, we'll do the surgery, but there's no guarantee that your symptoms are gonna get better. Um, so it makes us feel a little bit more comfortable when we get the defecography, if they have retained contrast, that we may be doing the patient some good by fixing it. So there's only about 10 to 20% of rectocele's that are really clinically significant. Um, and if you actually select the patient well, you, the success rate can be up to 82% on a one-year follow-up. 
So like Dr. Valdez talked about, there's a transvaginal repair and there's a transperineal repair and a transanal repair. I'm gonna talk just about the, the second two since that's the color, mostly what the colorectal surgeons use. So the transperineal repair, this is a patient that's in prone. And what we do is we make an incision, a kind of semicircular incision in the perineal body, separate the um, rectum and the vagina and then essentially recreate the wall between the rectum and the vagina. So we bring together, you know, uh, rectal musculature, the rectovaginal uh, fascia, and then we sometimes we actually bring the levators together to give a little bit more support um, down interiorly. The transanal repair is, is similar idea, um, except we're going through the rectum, we elevate the mucosa, we do a submucosal dissection, um, find the supporting structures, which usually is rectal musculature, and like I said, the rectovaginal uh, fascia, bring that together, excise the mucosa, and then close it. This is, um, all these have a similar idea. We're just trying to rebuild the wall. The way that you go about it has different um, um, risk benefits and outcomes. Um, I, the vaginal approach is very similar to the transanal approach in the sense that you're opening up the vagina, plicating you know, the, the structures laterally, and then enclosing the vagina. So uh, the first thing to do is when you're looking at success rates of rectoceles is to find out which patients actually, what, it, what causes a patient to do worse after surgery. And this is a study that was done in 2000 which looked at 89 patients who had both a transvaginal and a transanal repair and they found that pretty much the only thing that's really associated with a poor outcome is patients who have poor bowel function ahead before surgery. So those patients who are kind of have the constipation look to them, meaning that they don't um, have a bowel movement, you know, every couple times a week, those patients tend to do worse when you fix their rectocele. Other things that don't really have an impact is how long they've had symptoms, the number of symptoms, how old they are, whether they had a hysterectomy, the size of the rectocele, barium trapping, and whether uh, they have poor rectal evacuations. Those tend to not really have effect um, on their outcome so much. So there's a lot of um, argument over which approach is the best. Um, there's a couple studies that have looked at a transanal approach versus a transvaginal approach. Um, this is a study that was done in 2004 looking at 30 women, the prospective randomized study, and they compared after 12 month follow up transvaginal versus a transanal repair. And this study actually showed that transvaginal repair seems to be better. Um, improvements of symptoms um, compared to transanal um, improve the need to, f to digitally um, aid in defecating and they actually have a higher recurrence rate in the transanal. So this study, while they said that both, uh, both um, methods improve outcome or improve functional outcome, seems like the transvaginal compared to the transanal is actually uh, better for the patient. Um, so looking at a trans, from a colorectal perspective, a transperineal approach versus a transanal, this is a study that looked at a transperineal repair where we bring the levator muscles together versus a transperineal repair by itself versus a transanal repair. And we found that, they found that both of these improve functional outcome like they, like they showed with the vaginal um, approach, but only a transperineal approach statistically improved the outcome in patient, patient's symptoms of constipation. They had a better functional score. They had better resting pressure, better um, uh, reflex volume, and better urge to uh, defecate volume. So overall, the studies show that if you have to choose between the two approaches, a transperineal is better. And this included both the um, patients who had levator aplasties and those that didn't. So um, what they did show in the study as well is that the levator plasty actually helps in the functional outcome. So if you have the opportunity to do it, it actually helps the patient. And they concluded that um, any rectocele repairs can improve anal rectal function. Transperineal repairs um, seems to be superior to the transanal and levator, um, the levator plasty oh. tends to improve functional outcome. A um, couple quick slides on graft augmentation. So there are some, um, people that put mesh in to kind of give a little bit more support to that wall. 
And um, the studies that I saw actually show that this is really no improvement, and there are actually some significant risks, as Dr. Valdez um, was talking about. So let's just say I looked at 106 women, and they found that the rectal seals, of course, everybody says that it makes them better um, in their studies, but that the graft did not improve outcomes. Um, this is a different study which showed the same, that um, adding a prosthetic mesh to a perineal repair does not um, give you any better outcome. So in conclusion, the really what we need to what you need to know is that just because there's a rectus there doesn't mean we need, doesn't mean we need to fix it and when we do fix it we have to the patient has to un have understanding that even though we fix it their symptoms may not get better um, so it's really important to really educate the patient before you attempt a surgery um, if you carefully select the patients you should have a better um, results um, all methods are good to, will give you some improvement of outcomes, some seem better than the others, but it really seems like the um, approach that you use is really based on comfort. So I think, you know, the gynecologists are more comfortable going through the vagina, so that's the approach and they have great results. We have, um, are more comfortable coming from our end and our results are, are um, pretty equivalent. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.